this really is the book I'm the most proud of. It feels the closest to my way of seeing the world, even though it's fiction, right? Which is maybe ironic, even more than the nonfiction I've written. And I think a lot of that is that, you know, there's a lot of imagination in this book. And that was so freeing. So really, it's like the book I had to write, even though it didn't get published for 20 years. Welcome to the book I had to write. I'm Paul Zakshavsky. Today's guest, Jay Michelson, may well be the most prolific author I've had on the show so far. He's written 10 books and hundreds of articles for places like Rolling Stone, The Daily Beast, and New York Magazine. And he's earned degrees galore, a JD from Yale Law School, a PhD from Hebrew University. He's even an ordained rabbi. In fact, at the virtual launch for his latest book, the moderator introducing Jay simply joked about him being, quote, an overachiever. But none of this is the real reason I wanted Jay on the show. It's that after nine books, he's just published his first work of fiction, a collection of stories. And I was really curious to learn more about what that was like. The book is called The Secret That Is Not a Secret, and the stories all play off Kabbalah. That's the Jewish mystical tradition. And they depict mostly Orthodox Jewish characters wrestling with thorny spiritual and sexual dilemmas. His stories are much needed in today's world. He brings a lens that's feminist, queer-friendly, anti-patriarchal. And in our conversation, we also talk about how this collection reflects Jay's own journey emerging from the closet. I don't mean just sexually, but in terms of figuring out how to confront what felt like opposing interests, how to bring together his LGBTQ activism and law on one side, and his spiritual seeking and writing on the other. And we talk about what it's like to choose smaller, more esoteric projects, or to go for ones that are likely to be more mainstream. You can learn more about Jay at jmichelson.net or subscribe to his newsletter at jmichelson.substack.com. I hope you enjoy today's conversation. Uh, Welcome, Jay. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Paul. Great to be back with you after a decade and a half. It's been a while. <laughs> it has. Why was this book the the book that you felt you had to write? So it's funny, you know, when I when I saw, I mean, I was aware of this podcast. And then as I was putting the sort of press release stuff, you know, doing a press campaign for the book, I was like, well, this literally really is the book I had to write. It was like, it's not a gimmick to fit it within, within your title. I started writing this book almost 20 years ago. And it, it went through three completely distinct iterations. And I think, you know, a lot of, I, I got an MFA in fiction. The second iteration of this book was my MFA thesis at Sarah Lawrence in, God, when was that? 2012 or something around in there. And um, I think it's funny, I, I learned at Sarah Lawrence that I'm not primarily a fiction writer and that a lot of the things that fiction writers do very naturally, I can do but I have to really remember to do them. Like, what's the color of the person's shirt? And what do we smell in the room? You know, all of the tactile details, I think, that makes fiction and storytelling so vivid. I also have learned that I'm pretty good, I think, at articulating things. Like, I can, I'm, I'm, I now have written eight, seven nonfiction books and hundreds of articles. And that does come very naturally and easily to me. And yet, I really feel like, again, this may sound sort of contrived, but this really is the book I'm the most proud of. It feels the closest to my way of seeing the world, even though it's fiction, right? Which is maybe ironic, even more than the nonfiction I've written. And I think a lot of that is that, you know, there's a lot of imagination um, in this book. And that is was so freeing. So really, it's like the book I had to write, even though it didn't get published for 20 years. And I'm glad because the first we can talk more about this, but you know, the first version was, was quite different, and the second version was different, and um, I'm, I, I like this one the most. Uh, there'll be folks listening who won't have read the book yet, and so I want to ask you about a couple of the stories. You know, at least a few of them here, thinking of the mikvah story, the Sabbatean of Central Park, they deal with uh, gay Orthodox men uh, who are wrestling, you know, sometimes quite literally, with the uh, tension between their sexuality and their religious beliefs. And I guess I'm kind of curious to have you talk a bit about why you wanted to kind of create a space to illustrate or write about these men's inner spiritual lives. Hmm, Thanks. Yeah. I think in the very beginning, this was me emerging from that life, 
uh, being a closeted and not quite orthodox, orthodox, but orthodox adjacent person. And um, this was, you know, the, these were tensions that I myself was had experienced very recently. Now, again, it's more, over 20 years in the rear view mirror. So it's, it's more rendering that experience than, you know, living and expressing it in that first person way. But I also think that you know, beyond those stories, you know, there's one, there's one story with a, a trans character, there are stories with queer women, there was something about the, the it's like the heightened tension uh, that's present in a traditional religious context of attention that I think is present, you know, for for all of us, uh, to some degree, the pull between the material and the spiritual on a very kind of broad level, um, maybe eros and religion, um, more specifically, and I had dealt with that in a again in a sort of nonfiction way uh, in a book called, of mine called God versus Gay, where I made a, a with a question mark God versus Gay question mark, where I suggested there wasn't that conflict, um, and that was true for me too. And that was also kind of an activist book that that came out around the time America was debating uh, same sex marriage, and that is what I actually believe. But that's also a little more boring from a storytelling point of view than there really being that conflict and feeling the pull uh, in those two different directions. In a way, I haven't thought of this until this moment, but yeah, this is the like God versus gay with a period afterwards, because that is how some of these characters experience it, um, even though that's not how I experience it. In another story, the, I think it's the first one, the, the beard, which is about an ultra-Orthodox woman who literally hates her husband's beard. There's this, ten- and I think this is true in all the stories, there's like a tension that these characters live in a tension. And so for her, it's the tensions between her physical loathing of the beard and the fact that, you know, the husband has to wear that beard. It's a commandment. What was it about her particular predicament that interested you? I think there again, it was a very crisp instance of materiality and spirituality. You know, in the course of that story, she keeps trying to find spiritual solutions to her material problem. So she thinks, so with, you know, she enters into like the realm of Kabbalah, of Jewish mysticism, to find like the secret meanings of the beard. Because if she could understand that on a spiritual level, she could transcend the material. And that, again, we see that a lot. And I'm fascinated by that. Now, again, 20 years later, after the first version of that story, I see it. I saw it with people who I was counseling as a rabbi, and I see it all the time in our dominant culture with conservative Christianity as 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 this pull, right? And this tension, like being, you know, pulled toward heaven, but we're grounded here on earth. And, you know, I tried to make sure that the stories didn't repeat the same way that that you know, that kind of polarity plays out. Um, You know, for her, she's, I don't want to do a spoiler, but you know, she's not really able to escape the material. And she's, she's trapped. And she finds herself, um, yeah, really stuck. There's also for me also, there's a, a subterranean queer element to that where she where, you know, she's, she also has this kind of inappropriate attention to her adolescent son. And it's, it's kept very, suggestive, but not, you know, not, there's nothing explicit, but there's this sense in which there's a masculinization, feminization aspect that is, um, is part of her struggle, even though she can never articulate it that way to herself. And so that played in as well. But I, I think it's that fundamental, just we see it's, it's all that it's also, in, it's not just like um, on the, the so-called the religious right. It's also on the left where we can like escape the materiality of this world through some spiritual practice or, you know, the, the, that this is just a simulation or that there is some way of escaping this, this Gnostic tendency that I think is really human. It's not conservative or liberal. Um, I sometimes feel that pull as well. Um, and, you know, I teach meditation sometimes. I think the kind of meditation I teach is actually about being more present in the material. However, it's also true that it can be used as another spiritual escape valve or escape hatch, really, to like, you know, just get out of this conundrum that we're in. Whereas the secret that's not a secret is that this there's not a secret. <laughs> you answered one of the questions I was going to have, which is the, the title of the book, The Secret That Is Not a Secret. I don't want to, re- yeah, I have, I think, obviously, like a lot of writers, I left that very indeterminate, and I want the reader to you know, but I think that's part of, there is this notion, the, the Gnostic impulse is that there's a secret and the secret could be a conspiracy that's controlling the world, or it could be 
that everything is God, to quote another of my book titles, or it could be that actually there are aliens or whatever that, you know, or that Kabbalah <laughs> is real and they're the Sfirot. There are all kinds of ways in which there's a secret that like that, that makes it all make sense. I don't know at this. And now in our in our middle age, <laughs> yours and mine, you know, I, I don't know that there's a secret. Um, and I think the secret might be that there's not a secret. A lot of the characters in this book are orthodox people. And it was interesting to me because, you know, I felt like until recently, you know, a lot of Jewish fiction was consumed by the question of, of people leaving orthodoxy, like a lot of the stories in the mainstream. Right. And then more recently, we've seen both TV shows and books like yours, uh, in which the characters kind of live inside this orthodox world. And I was wondering um, what was interesting to you about that life, what, why you felt, or rather why you felt like these stories needed to be situated in that environment. Yeah, I think the tension that we've explored is just, it's just more acute in that kind of traditional context. And in large part, because the, the, the pull toward the transcendent is more acute. It's not just that like the societies are more repressive, although of course it is that it's also, you know, a lot of these characters really do have a love of God. Like they want that sacred experience. They don't, you know, I think what, what I I sometimes find missing in some of those, the ex-Orthodox narratives and some of those books are amazing and are written by friends of mine. So I'm certainly not putting them down in any way, but like, you know, there's there's often a struggle. A lot of those sort of presume an atheism on the part of, or or explicitly state. I'm thinking um, Abby, Abby Stein's uh, memoir, uh, Becoming Eve. You know, she just realizes in her as a teenager that she's an atheist. She just doesn't believe this anymore, and that's her story. And it's it's an incredibly compelling story. And but that tension is is uh, and it's funny now now that Abby's on the other side of her journey now she's like doing all kinds of Jewish stuff <laughs> that that, that uh, atheist or not that's where she's at now and um, but I, I wanted characters who feel that um, because that is something that I share and it's so it's funny it's like it's the book has a couple of sex scenes in it and a bunch of like religion scenes in it. And the religion scenes, everyone says sex scenes are the hardest to write, but I think the faith scenes are are harder to write in a way that's not the problem with both of them. And obviously the whole book is like, is there a difference between sex and religion? And I don't have the answer to that, but I have 10 different iterations of how, how it might be answered. Why do you think writing religion scenes was harder for you than sex scenes? I think they're similar in that, it's like the language that we use, it's really hard to avoid some cliche and just, you know, there's plenty of religious books, right? But as a writer, you know, I'm kind of a snob about how you, how these scenes are described and rendered. And you can only say like rapturous ecstasy so many times, right? It's like both in sex scenes and in spirituality scenes, like there's just not, it's, it, that was a fun challenge for me to find a way to render these diverse spiritual experiences, which are different from one another. That's another thing that happens is it's like they, there's a flattening of mystical experience or religious experience that can happen. So like rendering these diverse mystical experiences in a language that felt non derivative was a, that's the, that's a fun challenge for me. Yeah. And something that I work with also in my nonfiction, but also in my life. I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's a claim that these experiences are by definition ineffable, thus impossible to describe, and yet there's a pull to describe them. I'm not a believer in astrology. Um, I should, I don't know if I should have said that, but I'm not. But uh, a friend of mine did a chart, he did my chart, and um, he's like, You want to go be by yourself and have peak experiences, and then you want to tell everyone about it. And that was tough because that's very accurate. And as a non believer, that was challenging to my non belief. <laughs> You've alluded to this a lot through the conversation. Obviously, a lot of these stories, and in fact, the whole book is designed around, I don't know how to say this, the Kabbalistic tradition, you know, kind of wrestling with Kabbalah. I know people will have heard the word and not necessarily know very much about it. And you and I could spend all of this conversation and probably the next week talking about the intricacies of Kabbalah. But what do you think people need to know? going into this, what, what, what do you feel like they would need to know to kind of make heads or tails of, of your stories? 
I think, uh, you know, Kabbalah is the Jewish esoteric and mystical tradition that is a lot about levels of reality, hidden worlds, the relationship of the world to God, and how everything that happens in this world has some corollary or symbolic reference uh, in on other levels of reality. And that's all. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't... The rest is commentary. Yeah. I, I really did want... This is in the weeds, but you'll appreciate it. And it won't take, it's not a lot of weeds. You know, there was a view for almost 100 years in the scholarship of Kabbalah that the real stuff, the real stuff that's worthy of notice is like the theology. And then there's also all the superstitious magic stuff. And in the last 30, 40 years, scholars have realized that that's ridiculous, that actually there's a lot of really interesting stuff on these supersti- so-called superstition and magic. And, and I, I wanted more of that. Uh, in there. So there's a lot of paganism and some psychedelics and earth spirits and goddess stuff. And that for me, again, that was not in the sort of earlier versions, but as it's become a bigger part of my own actual spiritual life, it plays a role in there too. So, but there's a lot, you know, it, there's just, um, a lot of the characters do inhabit a world that is very different from the one that most of us inhabit because it's half symbolic and imaginal. Your previous book was called The Heresy of Jacob Frank, and I suspect this was your PhD thesis. That's right. Yeah. Tell me a a bit about who he was and um, how he was understood in conventional scholarship and what your reading of him, um, how that differed. Sure. Yeah, it's funny. When that book came out and it won a National Jewish Book Award for scholarship, which was a a lovely honor, that's when the publisher, Ayn Press, contacted me and they're like, you know that fiction project that we didn't want to publish? (laughs) Because they could see a continuity, not just the word heresy, which is in both, uh, heresy heretical in both, but... um, yeah, just it's like a continuity of themes. Yeah, that one that one is a scholarly work, so I tried to I tried to be as non-fictional as possible. Uh, Jacob Frank was a quasi messianic uh, heretic in the 18th century. Uh, the peak of his influence was the year 1759, when there was a mass conversion of his sect to Christianity under pressure. The rabbis had reported this heretical sect to the Christian authorities, and they had the choice to convert or die, uh, and they chose to convert. That was a scandal in the Jewish world. Uh, it was the peak of an earlier messianic movement that had started 100 years before. And that really was this crisis that took place really is what shut the door um, on a lot of Jewish learning of Kabbalah, of Jewish mysticism. And it also gave birth at the same time to Hasidism, to the next wave of Jewish mysticism. A lot of time, you know, Hasidism is like domesticated uh, heresy in a certain way. It takes a lot of the messianic and other teachings from these heretical groups, but makes it kosher and, and uh, puts it into a normative Jewish context. And, it, and it's obviously was, has been very successful for 250 years. Frank, after his conversion, which was insincere, uh, was thrown in jail for 10 years and then, or 12 years actually. And then his sect continued as a kind of bizarre Freemasonic esoteric lodge that sounds like, uh, you know, either some sort of anti-Semitic conspiracy theory or just, you know, a, a book by George R. R. Martin, but it's, but it was, it actually happened. And, um, you know, it was just this fascinating theology that he created a mix of antinomianism, which is the belief that you should transgress the religious law in his case, because that all of religion is holding you back from your true expression as a human being. And also a lot of sort of Western esoteric magic and some, some, some weird, very weird beliefs. Weird for me is a descriptive term. It's neither positive nor negative. Um, I have a lot of weird beliefs. You know, his were, were quite weird. And um, there's a book called High Weirdness, which uh, <laughs> makes the case for that, uh, that, that use of the term weird. Yeah, that, it was totally captivating for me uh, to write about. Most, for about most of the last 200 years, scholars have said, this guy's just a con artist. Don't pay any attention to what he has to say. But I found that wasn't the case. I had actually intended to study something else. But as I came to see, I just got seduced by the creativity and the originality of Jacob Frank's teachings. So it's not like he's my teacher. He was actually kind of a mean cult leader in a lot of ways. It still was just totally fascinating. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it it almost feels like part of your project is to kind of imagine where Kabbalah might have gone if it hadn't been for some of these doors shutting that you're interested in. Mm. Does that resonate at all? Yeah, it does. You know, there was a story that was, again, in an earlier version that was called uh, the re on the reincarnation of Jacob Frank. And it was him. Yeah. In a new form, you know, and it's funny. It actually, it didn't, 
it didn't seem to work. And I had another story I wanted to put in, in in place of it, just because I felt like I had kind of covered that in a in a way. Like it wasn't writing fiction. It felt like I was writing some kind of narrative nonfiction, and that's not what I wanted to do. But yeah, I mean, I think a lot of those. You know, one of the things Jacob Frank also did have preach a kind of uh, teaching of liberated sexuality and sexuality as as spiritual messianic experience and as a kind of you can experience the world to come, the messianic age, through uh, a kind of spiritualized sexual act or ritual. And that's in the book, definitely. I, I think that's just fascinating. Again, you know, there's like, I just, I don't know, I'm tantalized and fascinated by these things. And I, I love these kind of, the, the sort of wilder the doctrine, the more interesting um, to me. I'm writing a piece today about uh, there's the number one show on Netflix right now is about the end of the world. And so, you know, I'm something of an expert on people preaching the end of the world. Jacob Frank also said it was going to be the end of the world. You know, there's such a weird, again, in a non pejorative way, like such a fascinating diversity of beliefs that billions with a B of people have that the world is about to end in some form or fashion. And maybe we're right, you know, with climate change, but still, whether we're right or wrong, it's been that way for such a long time. And in so many different forms, that's just what intellectually turns me on. I feel like part of your project here is to kind of open up a space for, you know, a non-heteronormative reading of Kabbalah, religion, mysticism. I'm not even sure if that I'm framing the question in the right way, but do you do you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, that's definitely I would just say non-patriarchal. Um, you know, there are I guess non-heteronormative is certainly true. There are heterosexual characters in the book and and but um you can be heterosexual without being heteronormative, obviously. So yeah, some, I think that's right. Um, and again, this is why it's a work of fiction. You know, it's, it is sort of imagining. Um, and I think one reason, again, that it's not nonfiction, like why this that project couldn't be a nonfiction project, I don't know that Kabbalah is that liberating. Like, I don't know if it's worth doing that project. So I, I, I have written a couple of academic articles on it's one's called Kabbalah and queer theology and it notices just some of the similar tensions it's like on the one hand here's something really feminist on the other hand it was not accompanied except by in in the heretical movements and within Jacob Frank's movement and in Shabtai Tzvi's movement it was not accompanied by the actual empowerment or liberation of women so it's like it it gives in one hand but it doesn't it doesn't it takes on the other right and but there are those tendencies, and, and that's true, you know, for same-sex couples as well in, in Kabbalah or same-sex relations in Kabbalah, that it, it kind of has that potentiality, but it only gets actualized in the heretical movements, not in the normative ones. And um, that's why I, I, my launch event um, was co-hosted with Jericho Vincent, who's a very creative, uh, genderqueer, soon-to-be rabbi. Um, and Jericho's is invested in that. And we had these great conversations about, you know, what, what it would look like to create a, a non heteronormative, mystically inclined, pluralistically open Jewishness. And yeah, I'm, I'm for that, but I think I'm more into the, into it in a sort of imagination, imaginal way than in some kind of program or like, let's all get together on Friday night and do this. I don't really know what that would even look like, but I loved imagining it. Well, that nicely leads us back to the book. I You had mentioned near the beginning of the interview that this was a book that you had worked on for many years. It sounds like there were three different iterations of it. I guess, what what took so long? <laughs> no one published it. <laughs> that is one answer. Fair enough. I think, you know, the, the very first version, all the stories had down endings. You know, there was no, I, di- I hadn't found my way to l- liberation. That the one in which we talked about, the beard, kind of has that down ending. There's not an escape for that character. But a lot of the other stories do have potentialities in them that you know are precisely those which are forbidden by the normative religion, and those are the ones that are liberating for some of those characters. 
that was one of the I think so finding my way to that was one of the one of the things that had to that took time. And I think there was also you know early on I was looking at some of the same kind of Jewish American writers that you might look at and think like okay, well I want to do that. And yet it's funny, like I, I wanted to it, but I didn't want to do it. Like there were, <laughs> there are better ways to attain that, you know, even if I had the talent, which, I, you know, I don't think I do. But even if I did, you know, you wouldn't do that with like a queerly inflected book of interconnected Kabbalistic short stories. Like that's not, you know, I thought for a minute, it, you know, I was like, well, this is the queer Nathan Engler or something. But if you look at Nathan's stories, they're much more accessible, <laughs> you know, and that's not a knock on him, obviously, in any way. It's just like, it's what I, it's like there was a dissonance or, an, or a non understanding for myself as a writer what kind of audience a, a certain kind of work could have. I mean, as an aside, I think you rebel in the esoteric in, in a way he doesn't. And, and personally, I find that very exciting, but it's just a question of like the, you know, the reader, the reader's interest. Yeah. It's, it's, I think there, I think for a while and a lot of, you know, for people who follow me, you know, I have like kind of multiple careers, I have a journalism career and a writing career. I constantly make the mistake of thinking, like, I'll just keep doing my weird thing, but it's going to find a bigger audience for some unknown reason, because I'm awesome or something. And that's not, you know, that that's not how it works, right? And, you know, there are times where I've chosen consciously, that book, God versus Gay, was an example, like I chose to write a more mainstream book, and I wanted to do something with it, with a larger audience. And I was lucky it found a somewhat larger audience and, and great. But you know, when it comes time to think about the next book I have to write, which is what I'm in now, like, what's the next book going to be? I'm faced with that same, you know, I have I have one that I think would be a, you know, potentially a larger, a larger audience. And then there's like the other one that I sort of want to do anyway, even though it wouldn't be the larger audience. And it's it's such a question of like, of what our creative hopes and ambitions are, I think, as well as financial ones. I mean, as you been alluding to in this answer, you are someone, who, you're probably my most prolific guest to date. I mean, in the introduction, I talked about the fact you have a JD, an MFA, um, a PhD in Jewish thought, et cetera, et cetera. You're a journalist and a commentator. Um, at the book event, the book launch that you were talking about, uh, someone joked about you being, quote, an overachiever. And I'm kind of curious to ask you about how you understand the various educational paths you've taken. If you can understand them, I'll ask you the same question. <laughs> Fair enough. I, you know, when I when I was finishing up college, deciding what I wanted to be when I grew up, um, there were two main choices on the agenda. Since I, I my experience of the closet for me was, um, it wasn't just about sexuality. I was like closeted from all kinds of desires and. So for me, it was like being an English lit professor or being uh, a lawyer and trying to save the world and being a writer, which is what I really already was. I had by then written like an experimental book of short stories that probably no one will ever read, which is fine, <laughs> given their quality. It like that was like the dream that wasn't mine to reach for. So as between those two choices, you know, I, I really felt like the earth is burning. This was in 1993. So I went to law school uh, to do that. And you know, it was after a lot, and I, I took a year before and a year after to get a master's degree. It was in Israel, both of those two years living in Jerusalem. And that too, it was like, and even in law school, I cheated on law school by taking a couple of religion classes, which you could get credit for at Yale Law School, which was kind of nice. So I kept having this pull to do something other than what I was doing, ostensibly, you know, going to a very prestigious law school and spending a fortune of money to do so. And I did a, a, a clerkship. I clerked for, clerked for Merrick Garland, who's now our, our attorney general. And, and um, you know, that's like the sign. You're like set up for, okay, yeah. off you go. You're on the success path. And that was when I was coming out and just not, it just wasn't what I wanted. And again, I mean, it it comes to a sort of, I've come to see it as sort of a sort of financial privilege thing that I even had the ability to be like, well, wait, that's not what I want. I want to start an experimental Jewish magazine called Zeke. And I want to start a queer Jewish organization called Nehirim. And I want to write, you know, books and think about getting an MFA. And, and, you know, I had the privilege to be able to do that. And at the, at, in the last, like, I'd say five years, there's been a bit of a convergence of the different paths. I, I, the, the glib answer that I've given before is like, 
I used to have my meditation self over here or my spiritual meditation self over here and then the political lawyer journalism side over here. But when Trump came to power, it felt really clear that actually this was two sides of the same coin, that we were dealing with this profound spiritual, religious, ethical, philosophical, emotional trauma crisis that in America that the so-called smart people didn't see coming and still often don't speak in the right in in thoughtful terms about you know it's like oh it's just it's just the white working class or something it's like a, it's there, this movement which is sweeping the world not yeah. just the country is doing so for some pretty deep and profound reasons on the parts of the you know now you know almost billion people or so or if you count India almost 2 billion people who support right-wing nationalism. Yeah. That train may be coming back around. I mean, hopefully not, but yeah. <laughs> By the time this episode airs, Donald Trump will be president again. Uh, <laughs> well, this will come out in January. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm just kidding. I just wanted, to, will... <laughs> I just wanted to readers to, to oh. gasp with that and <laughs> have their hearts sink with the possibility. And I, so, so that's the thing. I think, I think there's been in the last few years for me, you know, a little bit more of the convergence of those sides of my work. And this book, I don't know how it exactly fits into that map, but it's the book I had to write. You know, so you've been doing a lot of recent um, CNN commentary. Um, you know, the the world's really changed for, for Jews in the last couple of months since October 7th, since the Hamas terrorist attacks. And I guess one, I just want to ask how you're doing. Uh, okay, at the moment, I had a very rough October. And um, I was surprised, you know, again, I have this whole meditation teaching career and and, uh, I think it's good to be devastated for a while. That sort of overstayed its welcome, I would say. And uh, I got better around Thanksgiving. And um, thanks for asking. What kind of sense are you making of what's happening to Jews post October 7th? And I guess it's going to be different here than in Israel. But however you understand that question. Yeah, I, you know, there seem to be a whole lot of things happening. Um, there's certainly among a lot of us who are on more on the left, you know, a kind of rude awakening when we see that people who we've marched with are not marching with us. And this was before the war. You know, I think now after, uh, as of this recording, you know, two months of Israeli military action, you know, there's a it, it feels different from the way it might have felt right afterwards. But even right after October 7th, there, there was not that support. And then when the war did start, I think there are people of good conscience who can have all kinds of views about, about the war. Um, but some of the ways in which that opposition, the opposition was being expressed, were so either actually anti-Semitic or just intense and so hyperbolic and using the most incendiary possible language that that was really shocking and hard to see. Um, and at the same time, there's still, you know, the same divisions that have always been there are still there. And uh, it, inside the Jewish community, um, there's a diversity of opinion. But I think it's a funny thing, you know, I'm, I'm about to start teaching a meditation retreat where we'll have folks of different political views coming. And luckily, it's a silent retreat, so we won't find out about those views. <laughs> um, but still, it's a fu- it was a funny thing we we're putting together, like how to address the elephant in the room. And we're divided by what we think about the situation, but we're united about how we feel in a certain way. Like nobody's feeling good, right, about what's happening. And I don't think anyone should feel good about it. I mean, you'd have to be a monster to feel good about what's happening in Gaza, even if you were on the pro-Israel side. And, um, And certainly the reverse is true. So it's this tragedy that is exposing a lot of generational fault lines and and political coalitional fault lines and um that really is the by the time this episode it airs who knows right yeah and it's just just when we think we've got a handle on the situation the situation changes jay i want to thank you so much for joining me on the show it's been been real blast getting to talk to you again this is fun yeah let's not wait another 15 years You've been listening to my interview with author Jay Michelson. I'm Paul Zakshevsky. If you've enjoyed the show, then I hope you'll subscribe in Apple Podcasts. I'm always grateful for reviews and for sharing the show with friends. To get show notes and a transcript delivered to your inbox, 
please subscribe to my newsletter, The Book I Want to Write. It's at bookiwanttowrite.substack.com. Every week, I also publish short essays about writing mindset, developments in publishing, and more. If you're working on your own book you have to write, or you want to get started, maybe I can help. Find out more about me and my book coaching at bookiwanttowrite.substack.com. That's bookiwanttowrite.substack.com. And thanks for listening.